coming up on Theater Talk. And by the way, he cheated too. Mm. It's yeah. not that, you know, he wasn't sure. simply in Hollywood, for instance, he would get involved with starlets because, you know, what's that famous definition of a starlet in Hollywood? Any woman under the age of 25 who is not actively employed in a brothel. <laughs> so there are a lot of starlets that <laughs> Kurt Weill could meet and, and have, you know, um, an adventure with. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Uh, one of the most fascinating relationships in the 20th century theater was that between Kurt Weill, the great composer, and his wife, Lotta Lenya, one of the great, great performers. Uh, this relationship, which in all of its complexity, has been dissected in a fine new book by our friend Ethan Morden called Love Song, The Lives of Kurt Weill and Lotta Lenya. And I'm delighted that uh, uh, Ethan is here today to discuss this um, complex, somewhat disturbing, but ultimate love affair between these two. I is that not the case, do you think, Ethan? Um, I wouldn't call it disturbing. I would call it two fascinating people who were so intertwined in life and in art that the road is not going to be easy. <laughs> but, and they did at one point, she divorced him at yeah, one point. That's right. This is not very well known. And, uh, sure. But they did remarry. And uh, it's not, the legend is that they ran away from Nazi Germany got into France, you know, and then eventually came to America. They didn't leave together. She was having an affair with um, a tenor <laughs> in another part of the world kind of thing. But <laughs> what's interesting is he knew that she would come back to him because their art was imperishable. And they really were two artists who were making one art, so to say. When he says that whenever he wrote a song, he always heard it as he was writing it down on the music paper in her voice. That's what he heard in his ear. And this was before she was really thought of as a singer. Right. Her reputation as a singer really comes from after his death in 1950, when she was persuaded, more or less at gunpoint, to go back on the stage and into the recording studio and keep his music alive. That's, right. That's the Lotta Lenya we know. She wasn't thought of as a singer. Where and when did they meet? And was it, as the old cliche says, love at first sight? Um, it, it wasn't at first sight because he was in the orchestra pit and she was auditioning and they couldn't see each other. <laughs> but they wanted to. Um, uh, it was a dancing role because she was an actress and a dancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the composer of, of the Magic Knight is mm -hmm. the name of the ballet. So he's in the orchestra pit and they ask her to dance a little something and she thinks she'll dance to um, the Blue Danube. And uh, she calls out to whoever's in the pit, do you think you can get through that? And he says, oh, I think I can. <laughs> and, but they didn't see each other at all. Later on, she was an au pair for Georg Kaiser, the playwright, and mm -hmm. Weil, who only wrote his operas and musicals with playwrights, because he didn't want to write the same old show every time. And if you get your standard librettist, standard lyricist kind of thing, well, actually, there were exceptions, because he worked with Alan J. Lerner, for instance. But he mostly liked Brecht, Maxwell Anderson, mm -hmm. Moss Hart, people who were playwrights, because they would not come up with the same old musical. In fact, they wouldn't come up with anything that had ever been seen before, and Weil always wanted each work to be different from each other work. So he's uh, visiting uh, the Kaiser family to work with Gerhard Kaiser on this opera, and the au pair is, um, is sent to pick him up at the station, and she takes the boat across the lake to meet him. This is the suburbs of Berlin. And the au pair is Lotta Lenya, because her work had dried up. And that's where they met. And she told many different versions of this. In one version, yes, it was love at first sight, and he proposed. <laughs> in, on the boat, on the way to? Uh, on the way to, that's it. Well, but I have to say, she was, she is, was one of those uh, people with that kind of playful confidence that is so sexual, right. even as a subtext, so to say, that everyone just fell for her instantly. Yeah. She was, and, and he was the opposite. He was very withdrawn, very quiet. He was always thinking about his next melody. He was always planning his next. This is a man who seized his destiny in his short life, because he only lived 50 years. Yeah, yeah. He accomplished an incredible amount because he was always ready 
to write the next thing. And it drove him crazy that most of his collaborators wanted to go play golf or wanted to go out <laughs> drinking or wanted to meet their friends at the Stammtisch, you know, of the local... Uh, Collect their nice big royalty checks, go on a nice long vacation. Yeah, but of course you have to write the show first before you get the... What's amazing to me is he apparently got on very, very well with Alan J. Lerner, who was the laziest yes. writer <laughs> in town. If you remember, <laughs> Richard Rogers was originally supposed to write On a Clear Day, You Can See Forever with, with Lerner. That was the original teaming. But at one point they were supposed to meet to discuss the, the next song and Lerner did not show up yeah. and Rogers called the house and he was told, oh, Mr. Lerner has gone to Mexico or wherever it was, he's gone to Spain. Didn't even bother I'll to believe cancel. that. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a yeah. as Curval might say. But, but, but take us back, so uh, there are various versions that Lada Lenya tells about this first meeting on the boat. He proposed right then and there. What other versions did she tell? What do you believe to be? It, it's impossible to know because I think there's truth in every version that she tells. I, she was a great storyteller too. She mm -hmm. loved to shock people at parties. With, uh, For instance, there was, at least she says, there was a time in her teen years in Vienna, which is where she was from, mm -hmm. Um, she had gotten a job in a millinery, and she hated it. Already she knew she wanted to go on the stage because she had performed in a little mom-and-pop circus, um, walking the trapeze. It was about yay high kind of thing with a little paper umbrella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're hooked. And, <laughs> and she didn't want to work in a millinery shop, and she had some friends who were selling on the street. And they said, why not? You, you can try it, too. You know, men, men always love you. And so she, she says... She joined them for a time. Yeah, she was a, gave her claims to have been a prostitute. Yeah. Spending money is what it was about. Yeah. That's all, spending <laughs> money. And um, at parties later on in America, for instance, theatrical parties kind of thing with the Gershwins would be there, you know, or Catherine Cornell would be there. And she loved to tell these stories. Well, you portray her throughout their lengthy relationship, which went until he died. She was constantly unfaithful. I mean, you know, just a, a, a very active sex life, which is almost... It, it, well, number one, it's unbelievable that he put up with it, but that you've explained that. But y it's just, it almost seems too much to be believed. No, it's, it's if you have a very strong sex drive yeah. and you are so charismatic that every man and woman who meets you <laughs> thinks, gee, I want a date. Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. It's hard to keep saying no. I, I, I know, believe me, I know. That's the, the key. Is That's that the key. Why did people he, made it too easy. And why did he put up with it? Because he loved her. Simple as that. Yep. When you and when he hit his personality, as you describe, he really was able to put, he was very even, as you describe it, and, and you say he was the kind of person who could just put up with megalomania very well, with, Although particularly he, Brecht. Yes. Yeah, also. When he was alone with Lenya or writing letters to her, because they were sometimes yes, separated yeah. for various yeah. reasons, then it, it's interesting when you look at their letters collection, letters to each yeah. other, is they're, they're going off on everybody, except Moss Hart. Moss Hart was mm. beloved by everyone. And, and he was a great collaborator with Wilde, too. He was fast and full of ideas, appreciated and admired him. And in Lenya's book, if you appreciated and admired her husband, you were okay. She went on tour with a, she was in a show by Maxwell Anderson with Helen Hayes, Candle in the Wind. Mm. And she went on tour with, with the company. And she could not stand Helen, Helen Hayes. Hayes. There was a lot of Everybody people, loved Helen Hayes. Not everybody. Just the people who <laughs> hadn't worked with her well, yet. Well, what was the thing about Helen <laughs> Hayes? Why did she hate well, Helen Hayes? Because she was, Helen Hayes was, about yay high and really cute, and she had a big following too, and she, she had a gift, although it was an old-fashioned gift, so she wasn't respected by, for instance, Eva Legallion, yeah. who was kind of pre-method in her honest approach. But Helen Hayes, under that guise, had the strongest will since Attila the Hun. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was indomitable, but in her quiet, you know, charming, manipulative way, and it drove everyone else crazy because she always had the best spot on stage, and she always had the great entrance. Mm -hmm. And when she exited, she took everything with her, including the grand piano, and it kind of <laughs> left everyone else in the lurch. So people who worked with her didn't like her. And a actors who had a very um, honest, realistic approach to acting didn't like her because they found her very fake and mannered kind of thing. But after this tour, and she would drive you crazy, but she would say, today the company is going to tour the local zoo. And who wanted to go to the local zoo? <laughs> but not Lottie Lanyon. Lot, 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 lot <laughs> and you had to go. But later on, she, Helen Hayes recorded, this was in the 78 days, of course, um, some patriotic, um, I don't remember now, verses, I guess it was, and Weil arranged the music around it so that she could not chant them, I guess, to claim them. Because she wasn't but there was a music there because she wasn't a singer exactly so and and she was very proud of it and it did very very well and she loved working with Wilde. 
as he was, which is how he pronounced his name at that point. Mm. Oh, I Everyone thought it was Vile. It was Vile in Germany. He Americanized it. He Americanized yeah. it uh, in right. great determination. And um, after that, Lotta Lenya loved Helen Hayes, because if you loved Kurt, then you, that was it. Let me ask you, I mean, you're, you're a music historian as well. Um, do you detect in listening to uh, uh, Vile or Weil's work a change in the kind, the, the type of songs he's writing when Lenya comes into his life? She does become an inspiration for a lot of things. And, and Absolutely. And but it happened at the same time as when he met Brecht. Mm -hmm. Before that, he was one of the Germany's enfants terribles. In fact, he's one of the two main ones. The other was Paul Hindemith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in those days, in Germany, if you wanted to be an enfant terrible, you had to write atonally. Right. That was the intellectual right. kind of music. Down with Schubert, you know, down with, with melody. Yep. What we want is, but it wasn't getting him anywhere. He wrote three one-act operas, like the two Kaiser ones, for instance, in that form. And uh, as witness to what I'm saying, all of Kurt Weill's works are being rediscovered and constantly played street scene and now becoming a repertory item. But those yeah. three works are Which ignored. Are much later, yeah. Because they're, they're not, they're, they're wonderful in the way, way he dramatizes, but atonal music can only take you so far. And there are a couple of masterpieces like Wozzeck, but basically it's not what people like to hear. And at the same time, he meets Brecht and he meets Lenya and the Three Penny Opera comes along and suddenly it's the Kurt Weill Cabaret right. and it's completely different music, but he always had it in him because his mentor was Ferruccio Busoni who was one of the last great melodists yeah, 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 in, yeah. In, um, in German music. I get from your book, and I also got a little from the Love Music, uh, the, the play that the Hal, Hal Prince, Prince directed, about it, yeah. that, that he was this very confident composer, but sort of meekish in his personality, and that he was so happy with this babe, even though, and then they had this thing where she'd be running off to... Well, he wasn't meek. He, he was withdrawn. Withdrawn. But inside, he was very busy, very yes. alert. Always, he was not the absent-minded professor well, at what all. What did he say to her? I, uh, you, you know, you're you're second to my music. But but he, Lenya, you know, you always come right after my I'm music <laughs> because she'd become the music widow when they got married. Because he would work in the morning, and then it was lunchtime, and she'd fix him whatever you fix in Germany in like 1927 or something. And he would have lunch and talk about his music, right. and then he'd go back to composing. And she'd run and off and screw somebody. All well, right, so, not yeah. necessarily right but, then, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's time for dinner, and she fixes him dinner, and they have yeah. dinner, and he talks about his music. And he goes and he's back to the piano and kind of thing. Off. And when she she's hasn't got a date. <laughs> she says, I don't have any kind of life, because she, her career had slowed up greatly. By that time, she was an actress, not a dancer. Yeah. Right. And she hadn't really, she never really was thought of as a singer, despite the fact that she was in the Three Penny Opera, and a theater version, shall we say, of the opera Mahogany, because she couldn't have sung it really in the original keys. So they, they kind of made a... A, a dialogue and different keys version of it to play in Berlin kind of thing. Right, and she as did. you say, we don't... But she wasn't yeah. thought of as a singer in those days. Until she became the widow vile and then started to do the... the, the well, she did the Three Penny Opera off-Broadway. Yes, that was, that was her great yeah. comeback, was yeah. the uh, 1954 right. Theater de Lise, this yeah, legendary... It's the Arthur, called, the Normally, Arthur. I like legendary for Paul Bunyan and, you know, the Golden <laughs> Fleece, but this really has let people speak about it so often. In this book, you're chronicling, really, the history of European culture. It's far beyond just the story of right. Vile right. and Lenya. Yeah. But you go back and you talk about how Brecht smashed the Wagnerian style in yes. German in German theater and with the Three Penny Opera. Talk the, about that. The, the, the Wagnerian thing was more and more and more to submerge the audience in this dream because theater isn't real. You always know you're sitting in a theater, right. but to make it as real as possible so that it's, it's romanticizing the very notion of theater going. No longer will the lights be on so that people can follow the show with their librettos, which they used to do in those days, mm -hmm. or even, you know, scope the house, mm -hmm. fan mm -hmm. themselves, chat, what, whatnot. The theater he built, Bayreuth, especially for his operas, and only his operas are done there even today. The whole theater is in dark, it's plunged into darkness. When the curtains part, you're submerged in this dream. Even though real life doesn't have people singing, ho yo to ho, you know that that's not your neighbor, for instance. But you forging, can, forging, and you don't sword, know any forging a sword for three hours okay. and singing about exactly. it. Exactly. But you said they were a musical <laughs> transcendence. That they were completely wrapped up, that the audience was yes. completely one. Yes, and you're supposed to really become one with the work. And it's, it's a, like a dream that becomes, it's mythology that becomes real. It's a return to some sort of ideal that I think never really existed, but Wagner thought it was the Greek. Well, some but then, it's some primordial feeling inside you that he's, the yeah. music is too yes. well. Yes, and, and it, well you become enough. one, really, with, yeah. with the presentation. But Brecht, it's just the opposite. The alienation. It's the yes, yeah. the alienation, which doesn't mean to put you off. It right. means that the, you're always aware that it's a presentation, that the actors can direct, uh, directly address you kind of thing, and no one is supposed to act. It used to drive him crazy later in his career when he was still in America before he went uh, back to Europe, is that the, uh, every, the method was all over the place in the 1940s. Everyone wanted 
you know, motivation and, and why am I doing this and what is it all about? And, and organic and the truth and the arc, the journey that I make. He says, stop making a journey. Oh, stop making Just journey. pronounce the words. That's Tell right. the audience what, there's a story. I used it in the book, but I got it from uh, James Lyon. Um, who got it from Abe Burroughs. Abe Burroughs, before he wrote any musicals, this is before Guys and Dolls, which was his first, mm -hmm. he was a radio writer at the time, Duffy's Tavern was yeah, Oh, yes. And he got hooked up with Brecht for um, uh, one of Brecht's plays, and Brecht wanted him, because he still wasn't that good in English, he wanted Abe Burroughs to write the lyrics to a song in this in the show. It was Galileo. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, coming, although he hadn't written for the theater yet, Burroughs was an American, and he was brought up in the theater tradition in musicals, or plays with music, what is the point of view of the character who's singing the number? Can't Help Loving That Man, for instance, or Rose's Turn. Everything is about the person who is expressing. So he said to Brett, and, you know, what's the point of view? Brett said, he has no point of view, just write the lyrics. And, and, and Abro said, no, 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 I mean, like, for instance, does the, this is a ballad singer singing a ballad about Galileo. Does he like Galileo? He doesn't know him, said Brett. Well, but does he <laughs> like the idea of Galileo? He doesn't know what the idea is. And Brett kept saying, no, no, no. And finally, Burrow said, well, why is he singing the song? And Brett said, because I want him to. <laughs> and that's the idea. It's the opposite of Wagner. Right. It, it's, it, you're kept at an intellectual remove from the work so that you can, almost academically, receive the ideas that Brecht wants to work with. And then it's so interesting that he could work with Weil because he really mistrusted music. He mistrusted the influence of music. A especially after Three Penny Opera yeah. became this phenomenal hit because of the music. Ah. Everywhere you went in Berlin, the music of Three Penny Opera was With the wallpaper, but people were not quoting the, you know, the libretto that Brecht had mm -hmm. written. And also they, they were enjoying the tunes without getting the point of it, which was a very cynical, exactly. tough and attack yeah. on Plus the political. you're not supposed to enjoy the tunes that's in Brecht. <laughs> that's right. You're supposed to receive the tunes. Yeah, 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 and yet yeah. then when, when they went on to write Mahagoni, which was at, during, uh, this all being during the, the Weimar Republic and the rise of the, of the Third Reich, that uh, Mahagoni, the, the Nazis were so bothered by the libretto that they picketed it and destroyed it. Oh, them. worse, there was a, a full-scale riot. But what's interesting is the stories never jive. Like, there's one story where the riot broke out at a certain point. Another story is, no, it was not till the end. And another story, the whole theater, there was like the seething cauldron of Nazi, <laughs> we're going to. And another one, it was all quiet <laughs> in the straight. So you never really know. I guess people do not remember. I know people who can't remember, you know, what color pants they're wearing, you know, if they don't look down sort of thing. So how do you expect well, sure. to remember like 40 <laughs> years later, 30 years later? So it's, it's, it's very tricky. But when you're going through the letters, uh, are, do you find things that are, you know, this happened yesterday, Kurt yes. writes in also, it's great. it's great to see where they are at different times because he's often, and by the way, he cheated too. It's yeah. not that, you know, he wasn't sure. simply, in Hollywood, for instance, he would get involved with starlets because, you know, what's that famous definition of a starlet in Hollywood? Any woman under the age of 25 who is not actively employed in a brothel. <laughs> so there are a lot of starlets that <laughs> Kurt Weill could meet and, and have, you know, um, an adventure with. And at one point, this is in Jens Rostek's book, Lenya had to make a trip from New York to Hollywood to confront her husband about a Swiss mädchen oh, yes, that he was yes, seeing, yes. and this is, and she even she wrote a letter to Rita Vile. That's how we know about this. The letter has survived. Rita being um, uh, yes. Kurt's sister, yep. and she, uh, there's this tricky situation where the the most cheating woman on earth is confronting <laughs> well, yes, her husband. <laughs> how dare you cheat? cheat on me. Well, you can imagine what he has. Hello, to say pot. Right <laughs> I didn't mean to, you know, heaven forfend I be moralistic, but the, the point, I was just so dazzled by her track record, but, you know, but he had one too. Now, you go, you go uh, Mahogany smash, things are big trouble in Germany, and they all had to leave. Well, give us the sense of, of, of when they realized they had to get out, how yeah. they got out, all that kind well, of Well, you have to remember that, I mean, we, now we know that once the Nazis got into power, which right. was January 30th, 1933, mm. the right. famous Macht der Greifung, once that happened, then, you know, things went for all the enemies of the, of the Third Reich downhill very quickly yeah. from there. But at the time, you have to remember that the, the various governments of Germany, they would, they would be on for like two months. They would and come and go. Yeah. And other, <laughs> yep, kind of thing. Right. So most people thought if they're probably not going to stay because these, these people are even oh, weirder yeah. than the ones we and they're, had. It's going to pass. Kind of but Brecht had to leave immediately yeah, he because he knew he was on the list. Yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. While waited, he had actually a show coming up. He had his last opera, The Silver Lake was coming up, right, right. and also he didn't feel he was in imminent danger. But the Silver Lake really was, everyone says, that was the last act of Weimar art. It was short, it was like two months after, maybe a month after um, the Nazi takeover. And at that point, and, and like to, 
I'd like to remind everybody Hitler was not elected. Hitler was appointed. Everyone keeps saying Hitler was elected. He was not elected. He was appointed chancellor. He lost his election, exactly. But he was, the chancellor was um, appointed by Hindenburg, who was the president. That's, that's right. what Hitler had been running for, and he did lose. Yeah, thing. that's right. I'm glad we had that footnote. And now, where were we? So, so, so Silver Lake. And after that, what, what, what dawn begins to dawn on him where he says, I, I got to get out of here? Right about then, I would say. It's um, after Silver Lake. I mean, in one version, there's a, he gets a phone call from someone in government, you know, leave. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. But, but I don't know if that really happened. No, no one really does. The point is, things were getting very, very, very dangerous. And Brecht had left, too. That must have made an impression on him. Other people had left. A lot of people went to um, Czechoslovakia because, you know, in Prague, everyone spoke German. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very few people spoke. Um, and he went to Paris. He went to Paris. Yeah. He got in a car. He, apparently, he was driven by Kasper Neyer. Oh, who was right. the set designer right. kind of thing, yeah. and also had collaborated with him on an opera called Die Bürgschaft. And I think the Nayers drove him, and, and we don't know whether they let him off at the border to sneak, you know, right. past some prop trees, or <laughs> he just went the normal way kind of thing. But he was in, and he believed, as many people did, that Paris, that France, would be okay kind yes. of thing, and wait and see if the Third Reich would collapse Let's see if that's the end of it. The trouble was, um, France was just as anti-Semitic as Germany was yeah, at yeah, the time. Yeah. It was not, not that great a... And he did go to England for a show, A Kingdom for a Cow. Mm. And what's interesting to me is, yes, he did, in 1935, he went to America, but it was not out of a fear that Europe was going to be dangerous for him, which indeed was the case. It was because he had gotten a commission Work. for a show. Yeah. Now, how do you compare, because we're, we're running out of time and this is such a fascinating book, but I want to get to this. How do you compare how vile, uh, and, and with him, Lenya, who joined back up with him in England, right? Um, no, in actually France. In France. Okay. We should just say, by the way, that she, she was away, right? I mean, when he yeah. was leaving, when he she left, was off yes. with the she tenor. Was so, and exactly, Otto Pizzetti. Yeah. But <clears throat> how uh, vile adapted in the United States, compare that with how Brecht adapted in the United States. Brecht did not adapt. Brecht does not adapt. The world adapts to Brecht. Brecht, in fact, ended up in Los Angeles, as so many people did. Yeah. And Thomas Mann was there, and Thomas Mann said, where I am. Germany is. But, uh, <laughs> but Brecht did not see Germany where uh, Thomas Mann was. He called Los Angeles Tahiti with boulevards or something yeah. like that. It, 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 he was miserable unless he was in a cultural capital that was German speaking mm -hmm. that would give him a theater right. that he could run himself. And that's what he finally ended up with in East Berlin. Mm -hmm. But right. Weil, meanwhile, came to America and this was the beginning of a whole new career? Yes, and he determined to become as American as possible. Mm -hmm. He changed the pronunciation of his last name, not the spelling, but now it's Weil. He's Kurt Weil. Yeah. He spoke German as seldom as possible kind of thing. He's, he did still write to his parents who had gone to Palestine. Mm. He wrote to them in, in, um, in German. But otherwise, uh, you really had to speak English if you wanted to speak And well. he folded himself into the Broadway world. The he Hollywood did, although world, I have to say, uh, everyone always loves to say, there's the fabulous Brechtian vial of Germany, and then there's this guy in America doing the mambo with Moss Hart and having hit tunes and so on. That is absolutely not the case there. Lottolenia said there's only one while, and Ethan Morthen says it too. There's, or, or there are 30 wiles, because every one of his works, except for Happy End, which was an attempt to do another three-penny opera. Every one of his works is different from every other work, and it's one drive line of his constantly trying to perfect the notion of music theater that will be as musical as opera, but as theatrical yeah. as theater kind of mm. thing. And he believes he finally hit it in Street Scene, mm. which is one of his very, very last works in 1947. But before that, he had uh, the September song. Yes, when he, well, he, when he, he they, there was such a delay in getting the show that he had come to America to do, which was this big biblical opera kind of thing, The Eternal Road, that he got involved with the group theater. He did the pacifist piece, Johnny Johnson. Then he did Knickerbocker Holiday. He did Lady in the Dark. That was when he really, that, that was an amazing, that was one of the biggest hits the, yeah, this, yeah. The Broadway awesome. has ever seen because Gertrude Lawrence in that show, and there were so many interesting things. It's about a woman undergoing psychoanalysis, yeah, yeah. of course, and it's a play. And Moss Hart was obsessed with psychoanalysis. He was, that's time. why. But at that time, you know, psychoanalysis was very, very little understood. Yeah, very few yeah. people knew about it. So it was very trendy to go and find out about what it's like, you know, when you lie on the couch and the doctor says, I am listening. <laughs> which is that's your right. cue to start. Well, they always said about Moss Hart, Moss Hart, he really was the lady in the dark. And remember, too, it wasn't, yes, that's true, but it wasn't a musical, <laughs> it's a play with three dreams that are operas, the opera and then right. one song kind of thing. So there are all these crazy things, such as Gertrude Lawrence does not, very, very big star, remember. She does not have a star entrance. She walks in almost immediately and very plain. Not the, the glamorous Gertrude Lawrence, but you know, with glasses and, and, and looking kind of mousy and so on. And she's on the couch and he says, Moss Hart's favorite line, I am listening. That was originally the title of the show, by the way. And as she starts to talk about this dream she had, and this magical transformation of the sets, the 
psychiatrist's office disappears and this glamour dream turns up and she is the queen of New York and everyone uh, is just amazed by her and of course she's made this complete change of costume and makeup and so on and now she is the queen of Broadway as we knew she would be but the trouble is that uh, in the cabaret that she goes to they're going to paint her portrait for the new stamp and when she sees the portrait she screams <laughs> because she has this problem but then there's this big number and everyone is dancing around and what you don't see is she's sneaking off stage and there's a double in her costume ah. who's dancing with everyone else and she's getting back into that to her, first costume so then the when the dream vanishes there she and is. suddenly there she and there she is the, the, Town was amazed by this show, not just by Kurt Wall's music, which is fabulous, but, but the Moss whole sta thing. Stagey. Moss figured this whole thing out, and he did not actually direct it. It was Hazard Short who directed it, but Moss was the muscle behind this yeah, thing. Yeah. And once Lady in the Dark came along, Kurt Weill was made. And Brecht, over in Holly in Los Angeles, is trying to figure out a way to get back into this guy's life because he can put on anything he wants. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Ethan, we're dead out of time. Okay. Just You're tell so us fascinating. Quick, just, but just tell us one quick thing. So, Lada does come, Lenya does come back to him. Uh, and yes, before they go to America. Yeah, and then he dies, and she has a whole nother career as the most famous James Bond villain, arguably, of all time, Rosa <laughs> Klebb. Yep. And it's all in the book. It's all in the book. It's a wonderful, wonderful book to read. And the book is called Love Song, The Lives of Kurt Weil, I've learned now to say properly, yes. and Lada Lenya by Ethan Morton. And it is Weil. We now call him Kurt Weil. We don't call him That's Kurt Weil anymore. That's when he died, he was Kurt Weil. Okay, all Not right. Kurt Weil. Not cr All right. An excellent book. Thanks a lot for being our guest. I'm, Thank you. I'm Theater Talk, Ethan. Good to see you. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can follow us on Twitter. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.